Hi, I'm Allison Hope Weiner, and welcome to another episode of Media Mayhem. Today's guest is Father Thomas Doyle. We're going to be talking about the sexual abuse scandal in the Catholic Church. Please stay with us. <laughs> Hi, I want to welcome Father Thomas Doyle to the show today and just give you a little bit of his background. Father Doyle was ordained a Dominican priest in 1970 in Dubuque, Iowa. He did his graduate studies in philosophy and theology at the Aquinas Institute of Philosophy and Theology, as well as his political science and Soviet studies at the University of Wisconsin. He went on to pursue further graduate work in canon law at the Gregorian University in Rome and also at the Catholic University of America, the University of Ottawa, and St. Paul's University in Ottawa. And he was awarded a doctorate in canon law in 1978. Father Doyle was assigned in 1984 to the Vatican Embassy where he began work with the church's problem of sexual abuse of minors by the clergy. Since then, he's worked extensively with victims of child abuse throughout America and also in Europe. I want to welcome Father Doyle and um, thank him for appearing here today. I think he's going to be able to give us some insight into how the church reacted when they first heard about sexual abuse allegations because he was there and he was heavily involved with church higher-ups in trying to find some way for the church to respond appropriately to the rampant sexual abuse by members of the clergy. Um, and he also will be able to give us some understanding of what's happened in the U.S. courts since then and the civil settlements and really what, how he thinks the church could be dealing with the problem of sexual abuse and how they can better help the many young victims who Father Doyle has spent considerable time and energy trying to assist and um, help them through this difficult time. I wonder if you think that the hierarchy and the way the church is set up almost is set up to keep people that believe in that hierarchy from reporting something like rampant sexual abuse in the church. Absolutely. Uh, the hierarchical setup, which is essentially for those who don't understand what hierarchy is, it's a monarchical governmental setup uh, structure for the Roman Catholic Church. So in so if you believe um, that the archbishop or the person, the, the cleric who is above you um, is superior and is the one that has the closer connection to God, then you would believe that they know better about this issue and that it's not really your place to bring it to anyone's attention? It's not only that they, the, the belief is that they know better, it's that they, it's power. They have an incredible amount of power and they use this power to control people. Uh, the Catholic Church is not an equal opportunity operation. It's not a democracy. The, um, and you said something to me that uh, the church is one of the two monarchies that's left in the world. And I wonder when you began to recognize that the sexual abuse was going to be a very big problem for the church, were you intimidated by the fact that it really wasn't your place to be telling the higher-ups what they should do and that it might cost you your career? Oh yeah, I was quite intimidated at first. I, I didn't know what would happen. Uh, I, I wasn't really thinking a lot about my career in the, in the early years, uh, when it first began, 84, 85. Uh, I was thinking only, you know, we got to do the right thing here because this is going to explode uh, into something horrendous. Um, and I, uh, I never, let me just say that your earlier question is this, does this, is there a fear on the part of people to, to disclose? Was there a fear on my part? Yes. Uh, the, the structure of the Catholic Church is hierarchical, monarchical. Uh, we're taught from the beginning that the bishops, the cardinals, the popes are very, very powerful people. They are higher above us, more important than we are. They are uh, put into those positions by, by uh, the higher power, by God so that if we uh, hurt them, offend them, insult them in any way, uh, there'll be divine retribution. And that's one of the main reasons why people were fearful of coming forward. And they were told this many, many times by bishops or those representing them. If you disclose what has happened, you will be hurting the church, you'll be hurting the priesthood, and, and God will be displeased. 
I mean, a lot of priests use that line on their victims themselves. And then the bishops and their, their, uh, uh, their underlings would use it on, on victims and their families when these people would try to report sexual abuse that had happened. It doesn't work that well anymore because a lot of that mythology has been dispelled, but it's still, it's still active, unfortunately. I've heard, you know, and you hear that from the, from the church and even all the way from the Pope and that they've tried to dismiss what happened in America as being a media conspiracy to destroy the church, sort of an us against them. When you first reported to the Archbishop and you had a conversation, these are my findings, this is my recommendation, what was the response from the Archbishops uh, to your report? and? when you were quoted in the media in the United States, were you um, reprimanded for having spoken to them? And in what, and what was said to you about going public with your um, feelings about what the church should be doing? Okay, let me say that at the, uh, when we were preparing the report in the very early months, that would be the, uh, the fall of 84 throughout 1985, uh, January to June in 85, there were a number of bishops and archbishops and cardinals that I was speaking with on a regular basis who were very supportive, very encouraging, uh, who seemed to be as befuddled by this whole thing as I was uh, and as troubled by it. Uh, and they were, were, as I said, supportive. So we put the manual together. Uh, the media, I never got involved with the media until uh, 1986, I think. I, I never spoke with anybody in the media until then. However, in 86, by 1986, I had had uh, been involved in several interviews, and my, my you know, I'd, I'd seen interviews by churchmen many times, and I knew that they would say no comment, no matter what the issue right. was, and that this was causing more problems than it was solving, you know, by saying, well, we don't know anything about this. It's nonsense. So I felt, I'm just going to be straight out honest. I didn't know how to be any other way, so right. I, was, I shot straight with the media, no matter what it was. If they asked me if this is a problem, I said, sure, it's a problem. Well, a, a bishop uh, wrote to the papal nuncio, my ex-boss, and complained to him that my uh, talking to the media was making the problem worse. And in the letter he wrote to the nuncio, he said, this pedophilia nuisance will soon pass. Well, and I'll never forget that. So my former boss was, was uh, good enough to send me a copy of the letter, along with his response, in which he simply said he didn't agree with this, this bishop. But uh, I was told by some to be careful what I said in the media. And at the outset, I was, I guess, careful. I, didn't, uh, I was not critical of bishops uh, or cardinals or the pope or anything like that. Uh, that didn't last long when I found out that, yeah, they really were causing the problem. You know, it, wasn't the, it certainly wasn't the media. It wasn't the gay culture. Uh, it wasn't anti-Catholicism, none of that. Uh, it was in the, the, the late Pope John Paul, the 20, or John, John Paul II tried to blame it on the United States, consumerism, materialism, and secularism, which was absolute nonsense. Was it uh, difficult for you to watch the, um, sell, the, the sort of reverential way that Pope uh, John Paul II was treated when he passed, given what you knew about his attitude towards the sexual abuse, the rampant sexual abuse in the church? Difficult is an understatement. It was very difficult. By then, by the time he, he died in 2005, I had had uh, intense uh, contact with victims and with their families, almost constant. And I'd seen and, and began to you know, internalize and feel inside the suffering of these people. And so I, I could hardly look at him as a saint, as a sainted person. He could have done something, and he did nothing. I mean, it's interesting because when I started reading about your work and your comments about the scandal and your myriad of attempts to try to get the, your higher ups to do something about it, um, and and your it it seems to me your disillusionment as you would find out that these archbishops who had said that they were going to do something were simply sort of shining you on um, that I. I began to think about those moments where everybody was gathered to uh, you know, treat him and there was talk of sainthood about Pope John Paul II and I, and I wondered what you must have thought when all of that was going on because it, it's almost as if, I mean the idea that this would pass doesn't even, it's so shocking, I mean that somebody would say something like that when 
it's almost like the, the church didn't grasp why this was a crime. Is, am I wrong when I say that? It's almost no, as... you're absolutely right. They never, they still don't get it. They don't get how horrendous it is. I mean, this is about sexual violation of children. You know, it's not stealing from the collection. It's not saying mass backwards. It's about, you know, violating children. And, and of all of the, you know, the crimes in our culture, that, that clearly is one of the worst. Um, and here we had this, this massive cover-up from the Pope on down, and all of it in favor of their own power and their own image. So when he died and they started all this, make him a saint now and all this stuff, I was, I don't know if I was a mixture of disgusted and furious, you know, one, the other, or both for quite a while. And what was your reaction to Cardinal Ratzinger um, being moved up to being uh, becoming Pope? Because it seems to me that he had, uh, and, and there's certainly evidence that has come out at this point, that he saw memos, that he was very much involved in, uh, and that and quite aware of the scope of the scandal, um, and pretty much followed in Pope John Paul II's footsteps in terms of trying to shine it on until the public pressure and the international scope of the scandal became so intense that he had to actually respond. I mean, what is your feeling about Card uh, Pope Rat you know, Cardinal Ratzinger becoming a pope and then his response to the same scandal? Well, I, I didn't have any reaction at all when he was elected. I mean, it had to be somebody. And um, <laughs> that stage of the game, I could have cared less uh, who it was. And it was him. But he did have, he had more awareness of this than any of the other guys working in the Vatican Curia because of the, the office that he held. Um, he saw these cases coming through uh, where men were, were, were being uh, uh, accused of violating children, and they did nothing. I mean, he could have gone to the Pope and said, this is a major problem. We've got to do something. But nothing happened. Then when, after he was elected, uh, my feelings, I have to say, are somewhat mixed. He has done and said some of the right things. He's met right. with victims. Uh, he seems to be uh, sincerely uh, compassionate when he meets with the victims, or at least moved and touched. But he can only deal with it from the framework of a man who's been in the institutional church for his whole life. I mean, he thinks that bringing them back to the church is going to help them. That's the last thing they need. Uh, and, you know, he makes all these promises and says all these things and tells the bishops, do everything you can to help the victims, but he doesn't enforce it. The best thing he could do would be to, you know, get up one day, get in the window in the Vatican and say, I'm going to start to solve this problem. First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to fire five of the leading cardinals who are enablers. Then name off five cardinals, do 10 archbishops and 20 bishops. Then people would start to think, well, he's serious. Well, uh, so, so, something akin to what happened in Penn State. I mean, they took drastic action when they imposed those sanctions uh, on Penn State. The Catholic Church has done nothing e uh, equivalent to that. There have been a number of bishops uh, accused themselves of sexual abuse. Um, none of them ever faced any ecclesiastical sanctions or, or penal process. Uh, none of the ones who've enabled and covered it up have faced anything. Uh, they all get cushy retirements when the time comes. That's it. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned Penn State, and we actually spoke about this briefly on the phone. But I'm curious if you think they're going to be, I mean, at the same time that the Sandusky trial was occurring, one of the higher-ups in the Catholic Church was uh, convicted of child endangerment in Philadelphia. And the trial got some coverage. I wonder at this point if you expect any other um, criminal trials of uh, church higher-ups or church leaders being held um, about, if you, if you expect the U.S. government to continue along the lines of what they've done in Philadelphia and start to try some of these um, higher-ups in the church, church leaders, for their role in the cover-up of the scandal? Well, yes. First off, uh, the Bishop of Kansas City, uh, Missouri, is under indictment, and his trial is going to start, I believe it's in September. Um, and they've done everything they could to, to, to squirrel their way out of that, and it didn't work. So he's going to be tried in September. The major breakthrough with these two, uh, the, the Philadelphia trial and this trial, is that they have finally moved in on the enablers, the men who have, who have allowed this to happen. There are several bishops who were eligible for indictment and could have been indicted, but they weren't. Uh, for p probably political reasons. They cut a deal, for example, with the bishop in 
the former bishop of Manchester, New Hampshire. They cut a deal with the bishop of uh, Phoenix, Arizona. They cut a deal with the archbishop of Cincinnati uh, uh, rather than indict them. But I think uh, Philadelphia, being probably the most Catholic city in the country, uh, major breakthrough. The two grand jury investigations were, were devastating. I mean, in what they brought out, in the thoroughness uh, with which they did it. The trial itself was covered by the media on a daily basis. Uh, it brought out not, you know, even if this guy had not, even if Monsignor Lynn had not been convicted, the, 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 there would have been uh, an incredible amount of damage done to the image of the church by bringing out the truth of what happened in Philadelphia over, seems, over many, many years. It seems but to I, this is the, uh, Excuse me. I'm Let sorry. Me just, uh, that's okay. I, I, I hope that this is the beginning of a trend that those who are primarily responsible will finally be held accountable. We used to say, those of us who are deeply involved, that it'll change as soon as one diocese goes bankrupt. Well, that hasn't worked, because now they use bankruptcy as a way to try to avoid uh, their responsibilities to the victims. It hasn't worked for them, but they keep trying. Uh, so now, the next thing is, if, if a bishop uh, is taken away in handcuffs, that might get the attention of the other guys to say, hey, the, 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 you know, the ax is coming close to the root here. Maybe we better clean up our act. Do you believe that Archbishop Mahoney, uh, former Archbishop Mahoney, who's retired here in Los Angeles, should have been indicted? Absolutely, years ago. And what's the basis of that belief? Well, the basis of the belief is what has come out uh, so clearly in, in, the, in the, the trials and in the, in the, in the uh, all the litigation that's gone there, that he was, he clearly covered up and moved these guys around. He knew about it. Um, he also lied under oath, uh, you know, many, many times in depositions and in, in a couple of trials he's testified at. But I think not, not only that, but I don't know if you're aware of the fact that uh, last week the uh, a Superior Appeals Court in, in California uh, let, issued a, a, a ruling that the archdiocese finally has to cough up and disclose the files of all the priests who've been accused. And that's where the truth is going to come out, much more than what we already know. And basically what you're referring to is, although there was a, there was a civil settlement in, Los, in California in 2007 with victims of uh, sexual abuse, in which part of that settlement was that the archdiocese had to turn over a large, vast number of documents, and they haven't done so. And it's been a very protracted battle um, to try to get the church to turn over those documents. And at one point, they turned them over and redacted all of the names. Is that? Am I correct in that? Correct. And, yes. They, they, they agreed in 2007 to turn the files over, and immediately, they, they, I'm sure they had a, they had a strategy in place when they agreed to that. That we'll agree to this, but we've got some other, we've got some other things we'll pull out in order to stonewall this to make it not happen. And that's what they did over the years. Uh, it enriched, uh, you know, a number of attorneys who were being paid by the archdiocese by the funds of the people donating, and finally they lost. Well, one of my sources believes and said to me that they think that the strategy is to drag it out so that Archbishop Mahoney passes before those documents become public because they're going to be so incriminating as to his behavior. Is that your sense? I don't know. I think uh, they may have reached the end of the line. Um, I don't know what's going to happen now or when they're going to start being disclosed. Um, knowing how Mahoney has operated in the past, though, I, I have no doubt that his, his lawyers are going to start, they're going to try to come up with everything. I mean, one of the more ludicrous defenses that one of the attorneys representing the priests came up with was that all these letters and documents are copyrighted by these priests and that to disclose them is a violation of the copyright laws. I think mean, that's insane. It's a good try, though, I have it's to say, as a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. The other, other um, apparent defense is that they thought that, the, that there was um, the disclosure of uh, church documents is a, a violation of the uh, privacy of those documents and that those documents are allowed, are, are being kept secret so that there can be the ability to have privacy amongst parishioners and their priests and whatnot. And there had been a lot of arguments along those lines. Am, am I right about that? You're right. Essentially, Cardinal Mahoney said that all priests' files are, are privileged. And he created this privilege called the, the formation privilege. And there's no basis for that in church history, church law, or theology. And I was asked by the uh, district attorney of Los Angeles County to write up a, uh, 
an opinion on that, which went into their uh, their motions to um, to squash this whole concept of privilege, and and they did lose. He took it all the way to the United States Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court refused to review the lower court's decisions. But that was their idea that this these are privileged documents. Well, that's nonsense. Well, let me uh, ask you about canon law. I mean, is there um, some law that says that uh, if a, uh, that the documents among the church higher-ups have any kind of sacrosanct privilege? I mean, is there anything in the canon law that those documents, say, between a pope and an archbishop would remain private? Uh, some of them are, uh, in, in, in canon law, are, are considered highly confidential or, or, or private documents. Um, the only thing that's equivalent in canon law to civil law privilege, right. in other words, something that cannot be disclosed under any circumstances, is information that's disclosed in confession or in spiritual counseling. Uh, that is considered privilege. But as far as co uh, correspondence uh, between uh, cardinals and popes and so on and so forth, um, even, even, co even notes that are taken in conclaves when popes are elected, those are highly confidential, but they're not privileged. And they, they, this stuff does come out. It has come out. Uh, as the Vatican opens up its archives uh, from time to time, a lot of this documentation becomes public. It seems to me that a lot of the defense from the church higher-ups about why they didn't act to disclose that certain priests had been accused of sexual abuse, that their reasoning was that they were basically just following orders. It sounds very much like a Nuremberg defense to me. Yeah. That, and, and you certainly heard that from uh, Father Lynn, that he said that he did as he was told. And I'm curious, uh, have, not being a member of the Catholic Church, is there something institutional or religious that required though somebody like Father Lynn to follow the orders of the person who's above him, even if they are morally wrong? Well, first off, you're taught in the seminaries, and in, in both diocesan priests and religious order priests, part of the culture is that obedience is, is of paramount importance in the Catholic Church, that you must obey your superiors because their orders are the word of God. Now, that's a myth, but that's what that's what the teaching is. And so this concept of obedience is imbued and it's pounded deeply into uh, the emotions and the souls of the priests. The other thing you know as a priest, especially a diocesan priest, is that your financial, uh, and your financial future and your career are in the hands of the bishop. He can cut your salary off, your health care benefits, your residence, and your retirement off, period. Uh, so obedience is very important. Even if it's an unjust, as we say in the military, if it's an unlawful order, which you're not, you're not bound to obey in the Catholic Church, you're not bound to obey an immoral or unlawful command or order uh, imposed by anybody, even from the Pope on down. But, but you, you should be prepared for the consequences, which could be quite significant. Yes, you've got to be prepared for the consequences, because the first thing they'll say is no matter what you think, uh, this is a legitimate order. Okay. And let me ask you this. The other thing that has been of interest to me is that many church officials have tried to equate the sexual abuse with the gay culture in the priesthood. And I'm curious if you think there's any correlation between, and you actually speak to this in, in, and wrote about it, um, between a very significant gay culture in the priesthood and the sexual abuse, the rampant sexual abuse um, crimes. Well, let me just preface it by saying First, there are a, a significant number of gays in the Catholic priesthood. Um, that means nothing to me. I mean, the fact that they're gay, you could also say there's a lot of heterosexuals in the Catholic priesthood. The fact that there are gays does not have any direct impact on whether a man is a good priest or not. I know countless men who have to be gay. They're, they're good men, they're good priests. The institutional church, the bishops and the, and the, the popes, have tried to use uh, homosexuals as a scapegoat to find something to blame for this uh, problem, anything to avoid you know, accepting any responsibility themselves. To blame it on, on gay men because the majority of sexual abuse is priests on males uh, does not mean it's a homosexual problem anymore than saying that adultery is a heterosexual problem. I mean, the one is, is now there are a lot of, of cheerleaders for the church, um, notably this Catholic Anti-Defamation League, this outfit in New York, which is like, you know, one man anyway. 
it's, it's a gay problem. It, it's right. Crazy. I mean, there's no evidence for that. The John Jay study, which the bishops themselves commissioned, uh, done by the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, the second one that was published this past year, made it clear that there is no connection between homosexuality and sexual abuse by the clergy. The key issue, much more important than the sexual orientation of those who uh, violate children, is why it was covered up. Why the bishops did not reach out to the victims immediately why they tried to cover it up, why they sent men secretly from one place to another, um, why they had been dishonest about the issue consistently. That's the issue. And let why me just, as my last question before we bring in producer Nick to ask you a few questions, you were there with a, a, a plan um, and a memo on how you thought that the sexual rampant sexual abuse should be handled, your idea about how the, how the uh, Catholic Church might respond. What was the response when you started to try, you explained to them how rampant this problem was, how many of these predators are in the church and how they needed to respond? You were there and I want you to tell the audience, I mean, how did the higher ups respond to what you were saying? I think at the very beginning, uh, there was disbelief. We were thought of as exaggerating and blowing it out of proportion. Um, I knew of, of the three of us, Father Peterson, he, he really knew uh, what, what the score was because he treated the priests that had problems that were sent to him by the bishops. Mouton uh, was, a, was a very successful lawyer, and he was very astute, is very astute, and he, he knew uh, what, the, what the financial consequences could be. And I think the most naive was probably myself. Uh, at the time uh, as to the extent of this, how widespread it really was. I began to quickly wake up and smell, and smell the coffee, though. Uh, but at first, uh, and even it went on for years, the denial about the extent of it, uh, the, the continuous attempt to shift the blame to someone else, to minimize the issue, um, denial, uh, blame shifting, minimization, and then uh, devaluing the, the, the victims, their families, the lawyers that represented them, the psychologists that helped them, and those of us who tried to support them. Then they started devaluing us. You know, we were there. They bypassed the whole issue of the reality right. of this. They're only out to hurt the church. Well, the church is these people. It's not just bishops. And if anybody's hurting the church, it's the guys running it. And why do you think so many of these predators ended up in the priesthood? It's a question I really don't know. I, there's a lot of speculation as to the, some say they, they came in because they thought it was a safe place to go uh, yeah. with their disorder, with their desires. I, I really can't speak to that you know, in any uh, authoritative manner. Well, I, I mean, to me, I mean, I understand that when somebody is a sexual predator, they're very good at manipulation and they're very good at hiding and in, in, in plain sight and that they tend to gravitate towards places where they'll have contact with children. But I've also noticed, certainly in light of the Sandusky scandal, that these patriarchal institutions tend to be a place where this type of crime is ignored. And do you think that the setup of the church and uh, being led by all men in positions of power had anything to do with the predators finding this uh, or, or gravitating towards the church as a safe haven? I, I think the, the all-male setup, you know, the whole Catholic Church is run by celibate men, none of whom are married or are parents. And that makes a huge difference, the fact that they, they do not understand what a parent is. You take a look at the the reaction between a bishop when he finds out about sexual abuse in his diocese and parents. It's, it's radically different. Uh, as far as your, your question, I think, first off, a number of the men that sexually abuse children are not true pedophiles. They're, they, they may be ephebophiles, which means they're sexually attracted to younger adolescents. And many of them are simply emotionally and sexually grossly immature. They may fall in love and have a relationship with a 13 or 14 year old boy because emotionally that's their own age. They're 14 too. Right. And this may lead to, you know, sexual expressions. Um, so to say that they're all um, these uh, skinky predators is not quite accurate. They're violating right. children. So it doesn't matter what you call them. A, a violated child is a violated child. And something has to be done. So playing around with the definitions of what, 
what, whether you call them a pedophile, and there's only maybe 15, 20% are actually true pedophiles, or an ephebophile, which is the word used for those who like young adolescents, or just somebody who's sexually immature. That's not the point. The point is the cover-up. And the point is the fact that the system, the clerical system, uh, keeps men sexually, emotionally immature, uh, and they stay that way. I mean, they're, they're, they're raised in such a way that their human sexuality has to be deposited at the door before you come in. It's like when you go to church, leave your brain at the door, don't ask questions, and so on. <laughs> um, so uh, you have this clerical culture, an all-male culture, uh, that does not appreciate women, or marriage, or sex, and tries to debunk and devalue all three. Well, I, on that note, and I think that's it's a very interesting explanation. It's a lot of, um, it gives me, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking a lot about what you said. But I'd like to bring in producer Nick to uh, maybe lighten things a bit, but ask a couple of questions. And we are in the mayhem round. Welcome. Lightening Welcome, it up. Nick. Puts a lot of pressure on me. We'll see what I, I can know, do. I know, it's difficult. This is not a light issue, but. Uh, um, we, I think we're going to get a little more into some of the current events, but go ahead. So, Tom, I wanted to first uh, talk to you about some headlines that are coming out internationally about uh, Scotland. And one of the headlines is Scotland's gay marriage law to progress. And it addresses the, um, the Catholic Church's response to homosexual um, marriage. And um, it, it commented saying the Scottish government is embarking on a dangerous social experiment on a massive scale and goes on to say, we strongly su suspect that time will show the church to have been completely correct in explaining that same-sex sexual relationships are detrimental to any love expressed within profound friendships. Um, and I wanted to ask you, do you think that the stance taken towards homosexuality has hurt and is hurting the church? Yes, I do. Um, first off, you know, a lot of people can see the very obvious hypocrisy. There's widespread homosexuality among priests, bishops, and cardinals. Period. I mean, you know, all priests and bishops were, were all, all cardinals and bishops were priests at one time. So that's a fact. Uh, secondly, they they have labeled homosexuals as as intrinsically disordered, which is a gross insult. I mean, how do they know? These guys aren't scientists. You know, they they uh, they all claim to to you know have all the answers for everything. Um, homosexuals are the are the current target. I think mm -hmm. uh, have been for some time. And certainly, they're, they're going uh, bananas over the concept of gay, of gay marriage, uh, homosexual marriage. I don't have any problem with it. I mean, the con love is love. And uh, I happen to know, personally, a number of gay couples uh, who have children. They're, they're wonderful, loving men and women. Um, the children are growing up in a very loving environment. Um, so that's, that's reality. Mm -hmm. And, and um, do you think as a result of, of this stance that, that the church is, is losing parishioners and possibly losing a totally a new generation of parishioners who are growing up in a world where homosexuality and same-sex marriage is becoming more accepted? They've been losing uh, people uh, gradually but steadily over the past several years, not only over this issue but over uh, any of the, the sexual issues, birth control, um, same-sex marriage, just sexuality in general, abortion. They're, they're losing a lot of people. They're just walking away. Uh, the Pew Foundation study done, I think, in 2008 or 9, uh, found that there are 30 million people in the United States who label themselves former Catholics. Mm -hmm. Not nothing, but former Catholics. That's, that's a lot of people. But the bishops don't get it. You know, they, they'll say, well, the reason for this, the reason they're walking away is because of, it's your fault, it's not our fault. Secularism, materialism, they don't go to confession, they don't light candles, crazy stuff like this. But they will not look at the system itself. Everything seems to be, according to them, willed by God and it's, 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 it's carved in stone and cannot be changed. Well, if you look over the centuries, the Catholic Church has changed its carved in stone, immutable teachings on a number of issues, mm -hmm. uh, and it can do so again. Do you think, that are there, is there a new generation of priests maybe that are being, that have been ordained say 10 years ago and possibly being ordained now with the express purpose of maybe trying to change the system? The, the, the current generations that I've seen uh, are scary. Mm -hmm. uh, this feeling is shared by a lot of other men, both priests and lay people that are, that see them. And I've often thought maybe my own reaction is, is an exaggeration. But it's not. A lot of these guys are they're they're imbued or they're they're obsessed with with the robes, with the titles, with clericalism. 
with a lot of the, the old-fashioned devotions. Uh, they, they want to return the church in many ways to what it was before the Second Vatican Council, before most of these guys were even alive. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think they're the solution at all. They're, they're, the, they're going to be the problem. They are the do you, problem. Do you think that they're attracted because of the, the church is so um, immutable and that they, they make that choice based on the things that the rest of the people that are leaving the church that they dislike, that these people are making the choice to go into the church because they like the stances on the issues that they're seeing? I really have never talked to any of them and, and, and to the extent that I've asked them why do you want to be a priest? What do you see about that? I've listened to some of the stuff uh, that's been written and heard. It's gibberish as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, the Catholic Church is a very colorful monarchy. It's got a lot of nice robes, music, uh, very elaborate ceremonies. Um, it's got a pecking order. It's got, if you like the medieval, you know, the whole medieval syndrome, if you like the court business, this is the place to be because it's still there. It's very much alive. Court talk, they call each other with these you know, your excellency, your grace, your eminence, the whole rigmarole. Uh, you know, a lot of people like that. And maybe that's what attracts them. That's not what the church is. The Catholic Church, by definition, um, from the Vatican Council and the scriptures, is people. It's the people of God. It's uh, the body of Christ. The people of God is the official definition given by the Vatican Council. And that's everybody. It's not just the, the guys in the robes. It's everybody. And the most important people in that church are the ones who are the most rejected, downtrodden, the, one that, the ones that need love and compassion the most. They're the most important. I thought it was interesting this morning I looked that the Austrian Catholic Church has mounted a billboard campaign to recruit priests and it actually it looks like a billboard we might see here trying to re recruit police officers or you know people in the military. It was very interesting. It's like an army of one. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and I wanted to talk to you about your time in the military. Now were you, um, when you were in the military, were you a military chaplain? Yes I was. I was okay. a chaplain um, in the Air Force, okay. both at the reserve officer and active duty. Because um, another headline that I found, um, Leon Panetta was telling uh, U.S. lawmakers that the, the military is facing a suicide epidemic, um, and a lot of it is having to do with a uh, lack of psychiatric care. And I wanted to, to get your take if there's any pressure or more pressure on military chaplains to counsel soldiers who are suffering from uh, mental health issues. Uh, well, when I, I left the military in 2004, uh, because of my age, I had to get out. Um, we were uh, involved, chaplains in general, uh, have to do an incredible amount of uh, human care work, for, for lack of a better term, counseling. Uh, and, and a big part of that is, is helping men and women in the military who are depressed, uh, filled with uh, trauma, anxiety, and fears. Uh, there certainly are not enough mental health practitioners and one thing with the chaplain, you have absolute confidentiality, which you do not have with anybody else in the military. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people are fearful of, of taking their problems to the mental health practitioners, uh, and they do take them to the chaplains. It's far worse now than it ever was when I was in with the, with the whole, with all the, the conflicts in the Middle East, uh, in Afghanistan, in Iraq. Um, I was in Iraq in 2003, but I left uh, before the insurgency started, before it really okay. got there. Um, and these, these men and women are subjected to unbelievable pressure. And, and you know, with repeated uh, deployments, uh, time away from their family, it's, it's, it takes, it's a whole different kind of war. You know, when the enemy commits suicide, and then they don't care about losing their lives. You don't know who they are, where they are. And, that, and so it's no wonder that the suicide rate is high uh, and that the depression rate is sky high. Um, so that, that's a major problem. And is that something, do you know, if, if you were talking to a chaplain that was going into the military now, would you encourage them to have some sort of mental health training? I certainly would. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I found my years in the, in the military uh, the best years of my life as a priest, and in many ways the best years of my life, period. It's an incredible place to do ministry because you don't have to concentrate on ceremonies, rituals. You're dealing with people directly, any kind of people. Mm -hmm. But I would certainly encourage any man going in, get us... If you have training, uh, get it, uh, ask for it, find it, because you're going to be put in positions where you have to come up with answers. You have to be able to either make a referral or do something instantaneously to help an individual. You've got to know how to deal with somebody who's suicidal, who's filled with trauma and stress. 
And Tom, I wanted to just ask you a couple of closing questions. Do you still consider yourself a Catholic? Um, in the broad sense, I'm not, I, I don't have any uh, uh, trust or faith in the institution, or uh, by that I mean the popes, the bishops, and the, the, the governmental structure. Uh, I, I'd say uh, I'm a Catholic in the sense that I believe in the concept of the church as people, the body of Christ. To me, church are the victims and their families. They're as important as the College of Cardinals, if not more so. Uh, and to me, being a, a Catholic, a good Catholic anymore, is not just attending rituals, uh, ceremonies, obeying bishops, and so on. It's trying to do what Jesus Christ would have done with these people, which would have been he would have been with them, embraced them, helped them, and certainly uh, tried to give them some, uh, some, some justice and some compassionate care. Do you think there's a place for where you could uh, actually get to a point of forgiving that hierarchy? If, what is it that they could do at this point? Do you think to regain not just your trust, but the trust of the people who have, have left the church or who have been victimized by um, priests in the church? Is there anything at this point that they could do to bring back um, the people that have, have, you know, that have they failed? Okay. I think the, the only thing they could possibly do to regain the trust of the people who have, uh, whose trust they have, they've lost, would be to, with regard to the victims of sexual abuse, is directly reach out to them. Don't send your secretary, don't tell them to come to the office, make an appointment, but go to their houses, reach out, and stand up straight and, and be honest. Say, look, I'm sorry, we messed this up. We did wrong. We covered up. We were selfish. We were narcissistic. And we're deeply sorry for this. And we're going to try to make amends by reaching out directly. Don't just say, I'm going to give you money for counseling. It's the human touch, the human contact that's absolutely necessary. If that started happening, and that was seen to be, if people saw the bishops and the clergy in general and the pope as being primarily and exclusively concerned about individuals who've been deeply harmed, that would start to turn things around. But I don't think that's going to happen. And, and I'm curious, if you had a list or could wave a magic wand, um, I, I agree with you. I don't think it's going to happen either. But, and I think that instead the church seems to be reacting by becoming even more and more reactionary and, and looking for all types of scapegoats, including the gay community um, and all the people that are, vi things that are almost tangential, all these red herrings, it seems to me, to keep the focus off of what actually happened with the sexual abuse scandal. I mean, it looks to an outsider as if that is happening. But my question is, if you could wave a magic wand, what members of, in your personal experience do you think should be put on trial for their behavior and the, in the cover-up? Uh, what higher-ups would you put on trial and believe should stand trial at this point if, from your, that, where you actually know that they've done something wrong? Well, certainly I start with uh, Mahoney, Cardinal Mahoney, Cardinal Law. Uh, where do you start? I mean, there's so many. I said, I said sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, I would start with those two. Um. I mean, you think in those cases, it looks to me, again, as, as just as not a member of the church, as if the church just threw money at people and hoped that that would be enough instead of reaching out, instead of apologizing, and that those who did wrong were simply retired rather than held accountable. You hit the nail right on the head. They have. And, and they, a lot of the, well, we've given them money for counseling. We offer, well, wait a minute, no. That's, counseling isn't going to cut it. It's spiritual counseling. You need to, you know, you need to respond. You need to move in and touch their spirit, their soul. That's what has been murdered and, and irretrievably broken by this whole nightmare. Uh, giving the money, it's, it's a cop out. It's easy to give money, uh, you know, and then say we've done our duty. We, right. We've responded to the victims. We've, I've listened. I've heard so many bishops say I talk to victims all the time. Well, by that they mean, you know, the guy, the victim. They meet a victim. They, they listen for a few things and they dismiss them. They don't really listen, they don't really know. But they claim the Pope now has all this contact with victims. I've figured out, based on the number he has met with and the number, the amount of time with each one of the audiences, uh, on the outside, the Pope has, met, has spent 1, 1 minute and 38 seconds with each of the victims he's met. 
you don't get much on that. Wow. You know, I, I mean, and it also seems to me it, it's sexual abuse of any kind, whether it be by priests or by, it's a particular violation of somebody in power who, who you look up to and who you believe has moral authority. But violation of children, that the children rarely recover. It seems to be a crime and, and a victim that lasts forever. I mean, it seems a very difficult thing to come back from when somebody's been sexually abused. And it certainly, uh, I mean, just throwing money at it isn't really going, doesn't seem to fix the problem at all. There's a lot of those people commit suicide. I mean, it just, it seems to, that they are almost irretrievably damaged by the, this crime. The damage, is, is unspeakable, it cannot be described. And, and I know thousands of victims that I've met. I know so many that are, 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 are disturbed, they're hurt, they're broken, and they will remain that way for the rest of their lives. So I know so many of them that could have had decent, productive, good lives that was taken from them because of what happened. And the, the, the ignorance about the effects of sexual abuse, the ignorance on the part of, of people in general, but uh, churchmen is, in particular, is incredible. You know, I, there's one bishop who's fortunately he's deceased, made the statement when he was when it was reported to him that one priest uh, had violated a number of children in his diocese. He said, "Little boys heal." I mean, that is unbelievably ignorant and offensive. It it definitely is. Well, I want to thank you for articulating the the genesis of this problem and 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 explaining to the viewers. Um, how it was dealt with from, from somebody who was on the inside at the very beginning of the scandal and certainly has worked very hard to help the victims of uh, abuse by um, priests and by, by their clerics. So I, I want to thank you for your work, but I also want to thank you for being describing and, and, and talking about this issue in such an um, articulate and um, understandable fashion. Um, your time was very much appreciated, and I found this to be a, a particularly moving um, moment and episode of our show so thank you so much for uh, for speaking with us thank you no, thank, thank you for the opportunity okay thank well you. take care and and continue on with your good work it's it's thank much you. appreciated thank you bye bye <laughs>